Welcome back to New Testament Survey, everybody, and to Module 2 and our discussion of the Gospels in the New Testament. Uh, we've already talked about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also the synoptic problem. And now we come to the last of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John. Uh, you've already been introduced to some of the structure and content of John in the previous uh, videos. And so now in this lecture video, I want to go a little bit deeper and talk a bit more about the theology of John and the significance of the Gospel of John uh, for Jesus, his life and ministry, and really for the entire Christian faith. It, might, it could be argued that John is actually the most important of all four Gospels. In fact, some have even said that John might just be one of the most important books in the entire Bible. So when we talk about John, uh, we're really talking about a very important and significant book in the New Testament canon. So let me just first of all address that. We'll talk a little bit about the importance and the significance of the Gospel of John and just let me make a few points uh, around that, uh, around the importance of this Gospel. So first of all, John is important because we could say that John is the most beloved of the Gospels. It's very popular. It's popular today and the Gospel of John has been popular all throughout the last 2,000 years uh, in the history of the church. In the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus uh, makes some of his most extraordinary statements about himself, just beloved statements that are only found in the Gospel of John. For example, it's only in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus also says in this gospel, before Abraham was born, I am. These are very well-known, popular sayings of Jesus found only in the gospel of John. It's a beloved gospel. And also, in the gospel of John, Jesus performs some of his most memorable acts. For example, only in the Gospel of John do we have the story of Jesus turning the water into wine. Extraordinary, very popular story in the church. Also, in the Gospel, maybe the greatest of all the miracles that Jesus ever did while he was here on earth is recorded only in the Gospel of John. And that is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. It's recorded in John chapter 11. It's just a, a dramatic and tension-filled story of Jesus raising Lazarus uh, from a tomb. And then only in the Gospel of John do we have the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Again, a very beloved and popular story in the history of the church. In fact, foot washing and so is still practiced by, by many different Christian denominations. Uh, around Easter time uh, to remember the passion of Jesus. Uh, this isn't really a scientific survey of any kind, but uh, folks have said that the Gospel of John has been the means of more people coming to faith in Jesus Christ than any other book in the entire Bible. And when, for example, when people are interested in learning more about Jesus and Christianity and a life of faith, most pastors and leaders in the church will direct people, first of all, to the Gospel of John. You know, read the Gospel of John. It's just the simple, most beloved uh, and popular story of Jesus that we have in the history of the church. So a second reason that John is important is that it is both simple and profound. That is, it is just written in very simple language not very difficult words at all that anybody can understand. Of course, the most popular verse in the history of the church is, is found in this gospel, just very simple verse that's easy to understand. John 3.16, remember, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Just a very simple statement about the basics of Christianity. Any child, could understand a statement like that. And yet, on the other hand, John's theology is very profound. It's very deep. And 
theologians and philosophers have been studying the Gospel of John for many years and learn something new every time they look at it. Uh, John uses a lot of symbolism and signs and sort of double meanings for things, very deep theology, and it just sort of boggles the minds of scholars and theologians, and it has for many years. I think this is a really, really good summary statement about that from Leon Morris, who's a New Testament scholar. He says that the Gospel of John is like a swimming pool, shallow enough that a child may wade and deep enough that an elephant can swim. And that really is true. No matter who you are, no matter what level of sort of ability you have or experience in Christianity, you can get something out of the Gospel of John. Whether you're a child who's just starting out in the Christian faith or whether you've been a Christian for 50 years and one of the, one of the most profound intellectual scholars of the Gospel of John, you also can benefit from reading this Gospel. So a third reason uh, for the importance of the Gospel of John is stated here that the fourth Gospel, John, is one of the greatest pieces of Christian theological literature written by an eyewitness. And so when you read the Gospel of John, what you notice is that it is deeply theological, much more so than the three synoptic Gospels. Uh, for example, in the first chapter, uh, John talks about the relationship between Jesus the Son and God the Father, just some deep theological sort of concepts. We call it Christology, the relationship between the Father and the Son. And, and John makes the point that Jesus and God are equal and they're of the same substance. Uh, in this gospel, uh, John talks about the nature of faith. What does it mean to believe and have faith in Jesus Christ? In this gospel, he talks about the theology of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, and 16, some of the most important chapters in the whole Bible on, on the work of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, he talks about spiritual growth and spiritual transformation, John chapter 15, and how we can grow as we're attached to Jesus. So there are some deep theological issues that are discussed in this book that are found only in the Gospel of John, and it is written by an eyewitness of Jesus' life. That is John, who was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus while he was here on earth. So it's an important, important book, deep theology, written by someone who was there to witness Jesus' life and teachings. Notice these quotes, first of all, by John Calvin, who says, I am in the habit of saying that this gospel is the key which opens the door to the understanding of the other gospels. In other words, you have to understand John before you can really understand who Jesus is. And then this New Testament scholar, F.F. F. Bruce, says, by this, speaking of the previous quote, Calvin meant that John interlocks with the others and leads us to spiritual truth unreached in any other New Testament writing. These are indeed the genuine words of Jesus. If they are not, then a greater than Jesus is here. It's a profound statement about John's relationship to the synoptics and, and how he leads us into this deep spiritual truth. Here's a quote from Martin Luther. He says that the Gospel of John is the unique, tender, genuine, chief gospel. Should a tyrant succeed in destroying the Holy Scripture, and only a single copy of the epistle to the Romans and the gospel of John escape him, Christianity would be saved. Now that's quite a statement, and I think it's actually quite true. You could actually make an argument that the two most important books in the entire Bible are the, the epistle to the Romans, written by Paul, where he explains sort of, sort of the doctrine of Christianity, and also the gospel of John written by the disciple John about the life of Jesus. So this is a very beloved and important gospel. So let's just think for a minute about the relationship between John and the three synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar, as we found out. John is completely different uh, in a couple of ways. First of all, just in terms of content, uh, 
between John and the synoptics, there are it's almost completely different content. They're obviously different. Uh, John is 92% unique. That is 92% of the material in John is found only in John. Let me give you an example uh, of how the contents are different, how you might not realize that. Uh, here is just sort of a, a few uh, 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 statements about Jesus' life that he was born in Bethlehem to a virgin named Mary. His public ministry begins by being baptized by John the Baptist, tempted in the wilderness, proclaims the kingdom of God, uh, teaches in parables, performs many miracles, is transfigured before the disciples, celebrates a last meal and institutes the Lord's Supper, prays in the garden, asking God for the cup to be removed, and then arrested by Jews, stands trial before the Sanhedrin, and is found guilty of blasphemy. You read through those statements and you recognize that that's sort of the backbone of who we think Jesus is and what his life was about. But interestingly, none of that is found in the Gospel of John. The statements that I just read are not in the Gospel of John. None of that is there. So we recognize this as the story of Jesus but that's not in the Gospel of John. John has completely different content and, and tells the story about Jesus from a completely different perspective. So the content of John is very different. Some of the unique stories that we've already mentioned, Jesus turning water to wine, uh, giving sight to a man born blind, the raising of Lazarus, some of the long conversations that Jesus has uh, with people. Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, only in John, with the Samaritan woman, only in John. Jesus' long upper room discourse, uh, the night before he dies in John 13 through 17, is found only in John. So just in terms of content, John is very different from the synoptics. So another point of comparison between John and the synoptics is that John has a much more theological emphasis than the synoptics. And we can see that in a couple of ways. First of all, the deeds of Jesus. Uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus does not do nearly as many miracles as we find him doing in the synoptics. But the ones that he does do in the Gospel of John are much more spectacular and have much more theological meaning. For example, in the Gospel of John, Jesus only performs seven miracles only seven. And in the Gospel of John, they are not referred to or called miracles. John has a special word for the deeds of Jesus, and that word is the word signs. Jesus does seven signs, and these signs are very theological. Uh, the word sign comes from the Greek word semion, which means to signify. In other words, in other words, the signs in John are not supposed to be things that we look at in and of themselves, but they're supposed to signify and point to something beyond themselves. Just like when you see a sign on the highway, you're not supposed to just look at the sign, but you're supposed to follow the sign and go to where it points. The significance is not the, it's not the miracle itself, but it's the theological meaning to which the sign points. So these seven signs will always teach something about Jesus, about Christian faith, about the church, about what it means to have life in God. So you can see that the deeds of Jesus are very different in the Gospel of John. They're theological. They point beyond themselves to sort of a deeper meaning about Jesus and faith. Let me just give you one example from the, uh, from the first sign that we find in John. This is in chapter 2 where Jesus turns the water into wine. And, and it says, this is the first of the signs, there's the word, uh, through which he revealed his glory. So it's supposed to not just be about the water to wine, but it's supposed to point beyond it. Uh, and maybe you're familiar with that story of the wedding feast at Cana. Uh, it talks about the fact that there are six stone water jars that are filled with water. And then uh, this is at a wedding feast, and then 
when the, when the wine at the wedding runs out, Jesus turns the water in these six stone water jars into wine. Well, on the surface, it just looks like Jesus is helping out a poor Jewish couple who ran out of wine at their wedding reception. But of course, there's much more to it, much more theology in this story. For example, the six stone water jars represent Judaism, uh, the, the purification water and the Jewish ritual of cleansing and, and the six jars are, are meant to represent Judaism. And the wine is supposed to represent Christianity. And so the sign that this, that this uh, miracle is pointing to is that Jesus is teaching that, the, that Judaism is, being, is giving way now and being fulfilled in Christianity, that Jesus has come. He's the groom. He's the new wine. And we're supposed to move on from the purification rituals and cleansing of Judaism to what Jesus offers. The purification and the forgiveness of sins is now found in Jesus and not in the old traditions of Judaism. You can see that these signs uh, are, are theological and point beyond themselves to something more significant about Jesus. Another theological comparison is around the teaching of Jesus. For example, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus hardly ever speaks about himself. In the Synoptics, his message is about the kingdom and what people must do to prepare to live life in the kingdom. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks all the time about himself. In fact, that's all he talks about is his himself and who he is and what he has come to do and, and how life is found only in him. Uh, Jesus says that he's equal with the Father. And uh, so Jesus himself claims to be divine and equal with God. And so the teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of John is very different. It's not really about the kingdom or life in the kingdom, but Jesus talks almost exclusively about himself and who he is in the Gospel of John. Well, what can we say about John, the man and the author? Well, as with the synoptics, the Gospel of John is also technically anonymous, but there are quotes, again, from the early church fathers that sort of establish uh, John as the author of this gospel. Uh, the two most important quotes are from Irenaeus and from Clement of Alexandria. Uh, here's Irenaeus's quote. He says, John, the disciple of the Lord, who had also leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence in Ephesus. So he names John as the author. John, who is the disciple of the Lord, because there were many other Johns, but it's John who was the disciple. And he also tells us that John wrote this gospel in Ephesus. And the audience of John's gospel is also located in Ephesus. Clement of Alexandria says, last of all, John, perceiving that the bodily or external facts had been set forth in the other gospels, at the instance of his disciples and with the inspiration of the Spirit, composed a spiritual gospel. So here Clement, again, names John as the author, and he also tells us that it's a much more spiritual gospel, as we've already found out, uh, very different than the synoptics. Well, what else can we say about John? Well, he has a brother, James. Uh, James and John are brothers. Both are disciples of Jesus, and their father is Zebedee. And you can read about uh, uh, that in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark. James and John and their father Zebedee are from the town of Beth Bethsaida, which is located right around the Sea of Galilee. And they were fishermen. This was a fishing village. And John was one of those first disciples uh, who was fishing and then called to follow Jesus. Interestingly, John and Jesus might actually be related. Uh, here, if you compare these three texts in Matthew, Mark, and John, it names the women who are present at the cross when Jesus is being crucified. And if you read it closely, the mother of Zebedee's sons equals a woman by the name of Salome equals Jesus' mother's sister. So that would make Jesus and John cousins. And that's probably the most likely conclusion that Jesus and John are related and that they're cousins. 
another thing that we can say about John is that John, as one of the disciples, was the closest of all of them to Jesus. He had the most intimate relationship of all of the disciples. And that means that John was the closest human being uh, to Jesus on this earth. For example, he was the first to leave John the Baptist and then follow Jesus. Uh, John was one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and then, and then John probably even the closest. At the Last Supper, uh, John is actually sitting right next to Jesus and close enough to whisper to him. Here it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's kind of John's nickname in this gospel, and it says he leaned against Jesus at that Last Supper. And here you can see kind of a diagram of the seating arrangement at the Last Supper. Jesus as the host, John sitting right next to Jesus as kind of the assistant host uh, is right next to him. So John is close to Jesus uh, at the Last Supper. And John stayed with Jesus longer than any of the other disciples. John is present at Jesus' trial. John is the only disciple present when Jesus is crucified at the cross. And John is the first one to reach the empty tomb after Jesus' resurrection. So a very close relationship with Jesus. Uh, he also had kind of a nickname. He was called the, he and his brother James were called the Sons of Thunder because uh, they were, uh, uh, would get a little bit exuberant uh, sometimes. There's one instance where, where some people in the town didn't believe in Jesus and James and John said, well, should we call down fire on them since they don't believe? And, and Jesus says, no, don't, don't do that. You know, don't, don't be Sons of Thunder. And then toward the end of John's life, when he writes the book of Revelation, uh, Domitian, the Roman emperor, exiles John to the island of Patmos. And it's while he's on that island that John actually composes uh, the, the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. 